<laughs> Hello, welcome to the Super Critique. Today we will have four artists over almost two hours. Uh, I think we have seven trees. Trees the artists selected to talk about. Mr. Neil, come on up when you would like. Basically, when we start talking about, like when we're when we're utilizing material, right? And we and we try to touch on some of those nuances that is very specific to the material. There's several trees in the exhibition that had some really beautiful touches of the characteristic of the foliage, the characteristic of the tree. And this tree's been through several nuances. It won Best Conifer, this is Scott in the room, Best Conifer 2010 National Show, 2008 National Show. Um, and then you showed this again at PBM, correct? Okay. And each of those iterations showed a little bit of a different form of the tree and touched on a few different nuances of the hemlock. And one of the most moving nuances of this tree that, that I was able to witness was at PBM, and the foliage had sort of this beautiful droop. And Scott said, I wanted to handle the foliage in a way that looks like the foliage is carrying the weight of the rain. And it had a huge impact on me when he said that, because it's like, oh, wow. We can even go that deep contextually in terms of how we style a tree. Most of the time, our styling practices and our thought processes around bone size center on, did I get that branch right? Right, did I? Is the bottom of my pad flat? Or these kinds of sort of mechanical nuts and bolts. And I think the reason that I wanted to talk about this tree is because yet again we see another iteration. And this iteration compared to the rain on the, on the needles and showing that kind of droop is starting to take on some of that negative space and that more aged appearance as this has matured from 2008, 2010, 2012. Now we saw it last year at PBM at Natives. Now we see it here with yet another iteration of it and it's just continued to get better and better and better. Now there's another reason that this tree is getting better beyond just Scott's evolution as a bonsai and that is the tree's grown into the form for sure, right? But we're starting to see the product of a really solid structure set. And that is nuts and bolts in the beginning. But you can't continue to nuts and bolts of bonsai. You start to have these different impressions, you start to have these different influences, you start to have these different ideas about how we can present this tree. And it doesn't always have to carry that aesthetic. It can be momentary interpretations and momentary displays of the different iterations of aesthetic that allow that tree to really reflect all of all of those different seasons, all of those different specific environments, all of those different touches of the natural impact on the shape of a tree. And so I wanted to talk about this just in terms of, if you guys can go back and look at the 2008 album, if you can look at the Natives Exhibition catalog, and then you can look at this tree now, it's an awesome opportunity to watch a tree that has a phenomenal structure and has been presented in several different iterations, evolve over the course of time, to really show you that process of bonsai, that process of age on a really stellar structure, to really see interpretations and see an artist present a tree in a way that is giving us multiple aspects and multiple pieces of influence to really build a beautiful aesthetic. All right, cool. Awesome. <laughs> All right. I thought about that one. Yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. All right, just to build off of what Ryan uh, uh, was saying there, um, uh, take you on a little journey here. So if 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 you if you think of a tree having a thin trunk and a thick trunk, either one of those two, old tree, young tree. If you can answer those two questions, if you can. Does it have a thin trunk or a thick trunk? Does it have age or youth? You can, you can help yourself uh, figure out how to handle branch length and branch complexity, pad complexity. So in the early days that Ryan was talking about of this tree, um, it even showed up at the first national show, it was 2008. The, the structure of the branches was not quite there yet. It had, um, it had a lot of simplicity, which is a feature of a young tree. Um, and these days, that has changed. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, in the early days, the branch length was correct. It was nice. It had, it, it had almost the exact same um, uh, canopy uh, width as, uh, as it does currently. But something has really changed. So um, 
let's ask these questions. Is this an old tree or a young tree? What is it? It's an old tree. OK, old tree. Is it a thick trunk tree or a thin trunk tree? It's a thick trunk tree, right. So on a thick trunk tree, how long are our branches? Are they long? They're long, right. Um, on a thin trunk tree, just to talk about the opposite, how long are they? They're short. They're close to the trunk. Uh, there's several ways we can make. Um, this is not about this tree. But just talk about a thin trunk tree um, to follow that thought, thought through. There's several ways we can make a branch short or look short. So sometimes we don't have the option of cutting. One of the key features of a hemlock is that you can't cut back and assume budding as you can on a spruce, a fairly closely related plant. You can't do that on a hemlock. So there's several ways we can shorten a branch. Again, we're not talking about this tree. We're talking about something that has a skinnier trunk. Lower the branch. That's one way you can reduce the profile, the silhouette of the tree. Bring the branch forward is another one, or back. And another one is to put movement into it. All three of those things, in addition to pruning, can shorten the silhouette make the silhouette smaller. So to go back to this tree, it has longer branches, thick trunk tree, that's quite appropriate. But what's happened in the last 10 years or so here is that we have pad complexity. This pad, look at the modularity here. There's several parts to this one pad. Yeah? In the early days, this was very simple, and that, that made sense. You're just setting it up for the future. Now, there's uh, enough ramification here and, um, and twig density and strength that, that, that you, can, you can create um, a, uh, a group of smaller pads that make up a larger pad and that makes this tree look much older. Okay, I think I'm going to talk specifically about the styling of this tree and what I did and didn't like about it. Um, first of all, it's really nice tree overall. The, the overall balance of it is, is pretty well. The one thing that really kind of bothered me was this branch in the back underneath these other branches above it that also comes over across the trunk. If it's a really ancient tree, I don't see this branch making it with these branches above. This tree, this branch would die out. So if this is really really an old tree, I, I wouldn't have put that branch there. Um, put it back this way so you can see. Uh, other things that kind of stuck out um, negatively about the tree is the wiring on it. There's a lot of wire, and a lot of the wire is biting in pretty hard on the tree. Um, generally, for a, a high-level show or a high-level tree, I would really like to see minimal wire, and, or at least wire that's not cutting in so much on the tree. Um, and then the other thing is a close look at the needles. It looked like it got a little stressed this summer. Uh, there, there are yellow tips on the needles. So another thing that you'd want to try and avoid if you're going to show the tree, have it look as it best, which would be a nice dark green color all throughout the tree. Balanced and full, yeah, I agree with that. And a lot of the things both uh, Michael and Ryan were saying too about it and have few comments of my own since I've been studying this tree quite a bit over the weekend and uh, have known the tree for a long time. I saw it when I was first in the club 15, 16 years ago. Scott's had it for a long time. He's done a obviously very good job uh, developing the initial structure and all that. And if you look close, you can, you know, you can see some wire scars on the old branches that it's healed out of pretty well and that'll tend to happen on these in the beginning uh, when you're doing major bends and stuff like that, especially on a hemlock because of the soft tissue and the pressure you're putting on, uh, you know, where you're putting more pressure onto a major bend, that's where it's gonna really bite in initially. And it kinda has to a little bit to help that branch set. So it's done a pretty good job of healing out of those. Uh, there's a lot of good ramification, as you can see. The one other thing I saw, the one other kind of negative thing I just saw, which is nothing that stands out too much, I would like to see this branch brought in a little bit closer towards the front, maybe grown out a little bit more so it breaks up the straightness of that young looking branch that drops down. It is a nice branch, it drops down at a nice angle like a lot of these old branches do and that's what you want uh, with an old trunk like this. So I think that could enhance it just a little bit better. And uh, along the lines of what Michael was saying, for uh, you know, since this is an old, thick, powerful tree, I like to see fuller 
more simplified pads uh, to go along with that. So although it is very poetic in a sense to think of it like the rain has been dripping on it, which it does quite often, I would still like to see things tightened up a little bit more and a little bit cleaner, especially for a show. And as Bobby was saying, uh, there's, not a t there's not a ton of wire on the tree and it doesn't stand out, which is good. However, a tree that's been developed this long shouldn't have this much wire on it still, I feel like. And uh, I think things could be brought together a little bit more. I think some of the pads are too small and maybe too many where there don't need to be. But uh, overall, still really good balance, really nice tree and well done. And maybe uh, finding a nice antique pot in the future would really go along well with that tree. Let's go a little deeper, right? So anytime that you have a tree like this, and particularly in Scott's case, okay, because you're talking about a really high level, a very intentional bonsai practitioner now that's designing this tree. And there's a lot of critiques about this tree that you could make about how it doesn't conform in terms of the nuts and bolts of the shape and where the branches go. You know, Michael touched on the fact that the dividing of the pads creates a, a different perspective of scale. Matt would simplify the pads. These are all the nuances of everybody looking at it, having their different interpretations of what this could be, right? Not, a, not, not as much wire, a little bit cleaner, a little bit darker, lower branches. But when you start to talk, talk and think about the person that's presenting this or the intention behind the presentation, just talking about this lower branch right here, this starts to tap into sort of a level of aesthetic concept that as the viewer, you've got to ask yourself, why would that branch be there? Why would Scott leave that branch there? Okay, now this tree has always had a very characteristic or a very significant flaw from the perspective that it has inverse taper, right? And you can see that inverse taper. But how do you take the elements that exist in the tree and confront those aesthetic limitations or flaws to nullify or mitigate some of their visual impact on the tree and show the tree at its best. If you take this branch off and you lose that positive space behind that negative space that exists around that inverse taper, you notice the inverse taper more. So there even are though it doesn't to deal with that problem too. What's that? There are other ways to deal with reverse taper issues. Potentially, a absolutely, right? There's multiple ways to deal with issues and to deal with those things. And each person that presents a tree is gonna come up with a different solution to be able to deal with those, right? There's not a right way to deal with inverse taper. There's not a wrong way to deal with inverse taper. There's multiple solutions to aesthetics or limitations in a tree. Scott chose to, I'm assuming, use this to cut down on the negative space so that the inverse taper of the tree isn't highlighted. This is a great way. If you look at trees in the Coke of Exhibition, there are so many trees in the Cocoa Exhibition that have inverse taper and they have a branch that interacts with that negative space to decrease the visual appearance of that inverse taper. This is one technique. Changing the angle and increasing the width of the base, this is another technique, right? There's more and more physical techniques that we could utilize to, de to decrease inverse taper. But when you guys are looking, it's not a matter of the tree has inverse taper, it's not good, right? One of the best trees at the national show last weekend had horrific inverse taper. And the design solution to dealing with that inverse taper was one of the most cerebral intelligent things I've seen in bonsai to date in North America. It was from Canada, it was amazing, it was a larch. They came up with design solutions that made the composition so rich and the inverse taper didn't matter in terms of the power and impact of that composition. And I think this is a really intelligent use of that lowest branch. And one thing that you guys as viewers can take away, how do I deal with that issue? Here's one option and one way that you can deal with that issue, knowing that negative space is a very powerful visual draw to a tree. This is a very intelligent tree in my mind. I'm going to open it up for a couple of questions if anyone has any. Hands? Volunteers? This is your only chance. <laughs> While they're swapping out, maybe we could talk real quickly about hemlock, how to care for them. Um, this is not a pine. It should be grown right around where you have your Japanese maples. If you had sh shade cloth, that's where it should go. I think in the Willamette Valley, in the lowland areas, hemlock is borderline in full sun. Try to uh, shade it just a little bit. I ran to everything. Was it, uh, did I have the so highest score on it? You chose a gigantic one that you couldn't move? 
Oh, we chose that. <laughs> I chose that. This is your alternate. This is your alternate. All right, then I have to talk, I guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, Shimpaku Juniper, raised root, cascade. This, uh, this tree has some nice potential. Um, my feeling was that it wasn't quite ready to be in a show, not in terms of um, time. We don't need an extra year or two for have, to have this in a show. We just need a little bit more wiring. Uh, this area here should be the densest part of the tree, and we can see right through it. So all it needs is a little bit of uh, fine wire up here, make this dense, um, and make it really clean. It's, it's kind of jagged and pointy. Uh, if you can make this area clean and this area clean right underneath the pad, these are your two most important areas. You can screw up everything. You know, jazz artists know this one. If you, if you start well and you end well, it doesn't matter what the hell you do in the middle. But this here <laughs> needs to be tight. Also, I think it's a little broad. It's not a thin trunk tree. But it's, it, 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 this could be in a little, 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 little bit. It's, it's a little bit broad. Uh, canopy size, width of, of the branch. Oh, thank you. Yeah. See it from the side. You can see how broad the canopy is on this tree. Go for it, Matt. That's it. Oh, my turn? OK. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> It's a warm mic. Uh, it. The one, one thing I noticed when we were critiquing last night about this tree uh, although it has a nice, you know, nice old, uh, nice gen there, nice deadwood feature, I would like to see a little less negative space in between the two counterparts, making the tree appear more as one and not two separate trees. That's kind of how I feel right now. I like the, I really like the cascading branch. I think that's a really nice branch, and I'd like to just uh, maybe, if some of these branches could be dropped down a little bit more into here, I think they can. Uh, it might take a little bit of raffia. It might take set you back a little bit, but. For a tree like this, or any tree, I think it's worth it if you can uh, improve it uh, any way uh, you see fit or needs to be. That's what I would want to do: is try to try to bring this foliage down in the middle a little a little lower, since it is a cascade. And then everything Michael said, I agree with about the the canopy there, reducing or you know putting more separation, making that less broad, more compact. All those things will really make that trunk and that cascade branch stand out more. Can we turn it towards the, the cam, so the detail cam can get like a good yeah, shot of it? Thank you. E easy, <laughs> easy, easy. I want to uh, I want to go a little bit deeper, right, than just um, sort of talking about because anytime we have a tree like this, and 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 there are either this was selectively removed, these pieces were selectively removed, or they were intentionally removed, right? And when we start to talk about the idea of age in a tree, and you start to see this progression of age in the history of a tree, one of the indicators of age is the opening up of negative space and the remnants of, of what were, okay? What was. These used to be branches, and they're no longer there. Now, this branch is pivotal in this design because it does connect this with the rest of the tree. This negative space starts to insinuate age, and the gen starts to show what was there that no longer is there. If we create those intentionally and then we fill those again, we start to nullify that age and we take it back into a construct, right? But if you're going to choose to elevate the age of this area, you also have to elevate the age of this area. And this is where the discrepancy in the shape exists because we've got so many branches up here. We've got this continuity of deadwood that occurs through the shape of the tree and then we get into a really robust, vigorous, healthy crown. And that crown, if it were reduced, we're talking about the broadness. But let's go beyond the broadness just in terms of the width and the silhouette of the shape and start to say if we carry that thematic through the rest of the tree, it's going to be more powerful. Okay? Now there's another idea here, and that is Michael said this needs to be the densest part of the tree. Why does the crown need to be the densest part of the tree? Okay, it gets the most sunshine potentially. Now do we want to show energy discrepancy or density discrepancy in the tree? Is that ideal? Does your eye pick up on dense and sparse? Right, and so for your distribution, when we represent positive space and negative space, technically the positive space should have the same distribution in any area where we show positive space so that you don't see dense and sparse in positive space and you have clearly delineated negative space, okay? But when we start to get to the crown, whereas we have a lot of foliage mass, when you're looking at this in the 2D, you have a lot of foliage mass that's accumulating that positive space and that mass. When you start to look through the crown, you don't have that same amount of depth and that same amount of accumulation of needle mass.
So in order to give that impression of the consistency of density and positive space in the crown, it takes a little bit more than the lower branches because the lower branches are presented here. We've got layers of foliage that you're looking through to get that density, and here you're looking through one layer or maybe two. Right? So this is just concepts of when we talk about that density, we also need to discuss how do you achieve that density and why does that density need to be there and how is that different than the density in the other portions of the tree. One more discussion about the container. So we have a broad base, but you have a lot of negative spaces in that exposed root style. Okay? Broad base says stability. Negative space says instability. This is an expo exposed root style tree. So those spaces decreasing that stability says that this is leaning a little bit more towards a feminine form. It has very curvaceous movement. Now we've got a very masculine, super high quality, beautiful container on the tree, but very masculine from the square shape and also the straight wall, where our base is very close to the same width as the rim of the container. This is a very stable container in a tree that has a lot more elegance in that space and that movement of those roots. And we can pick up on that and pull more on that delicate characteristic with either a greater slant to the wall or some sort of rounding, maybe lobed, maybe hexagonal, octagonal sort of container to really highlight that sort of feminine movement, that curvaceous movement, that slight sort of lean towards delicacy, and if you do that, then you definitely have to carry the thematic of reducing that number of branches from that lower portion, which we've already started to touch on, through the crown, right? So it's just continuity of the totality of the concept from bottom to top of the tree that really sort of gives the viewer that clear delineation and communication of what you are trying to create with the tree and what message you're trying to deliver. There is no right or wrong, it's a choice. It's a choice, it was a choice to remove that branch. It's a choice to carry that design through. It's a choice to execute that design in the container combination as well. Very high quality, very high potential. There's just that next level that we can take this to that would truly execute a really powerful composition. I to, oh, sorry, I wanted to add one more thing uh, about why I was saying bring these branches down a little bit. I do uh, like the fact that there's more deadwood on the tree that does enhance the age. But knowing that the top needs to be more compact for all those reasons we just talked about, how is that going to happen if this branch is here? There's not going to be enough space in between those then. So by bringing this down a little bit, you create space for branches up high to also be lowered, which allows you to work towards that more compact full crown. Yeah, I think they touched on pretty much everything with history. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys out there... Needs a little work, but overall a nice tree. One of the best parts about all of us being up on stage is you're going to hear a lot of different perspectives of, of, how to, of how to handle these different solutions, right? And so for you guys, you may say, yes, I would want to create a sparser crown that has more remnants and more negative space. This is one way to compress the design, right? Or you may say, yes, I would like to see it more dense and lower those branches to give that room. This is another way to compress design. And again, c continue to come back to the idea that Matt, Bobby, Michael, and myself, we all have different training, different interpretations of, of what makes a bonsai. And that's, that's very personal to us. And each of you guys, when you're making your trees, has a different interpretation of what that tree is going to be and what maximizes that tree at that stage of development and that iteration of the aesthetic. So if you pick out the techniques and the different sort of vantage points that each of us is looking at this, you're going to arm yourself with more tools in terms of how can you skin a cat. There's multiple ways to skin a cat. And you, you're getting all of these different ways and methodologies and opinions about aesthetic. That's the most valuable part about this kind of super critique. Because when you go and you listen to a critique one, one, from one person, you only get one perspective. This is why this is so valuable. Because you're getting a lot of different perspectives about how you can handle the same situation. Are there any questions? Anybody? Roger. Uh, two comments. Uh, from looking at the tree from this side, which, which is the, where, where do you have as the front? That's the front. Oh, that's probably why that makes a difference. Um, <laughs> it's still, it's still served it up for you, Roger. Looks very linear. Mm. You mean two, two, two dimensional. dimensional? Very two dimensional. Mm. Uh, secondly, and I know it's not the end of the world, but it's also touch the, the, the dropping branch is also touching the pot. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me does not look appropriate. I think it'd be nice to have a little bit of space also. I'm sorry? I think it would also be, yeah, it would be nice to have a little bit of space. 
especially with the exposed root. Mm. It, I think it, it looks like point. it's being held up by that branch hit, touching the pot. Strong point. I think that's a strong point because you're already talking about negative space as being a very, very thematic of the design, right? So then if you carry that through all of those touch points where you can execute that negative space and show that space in the drop, I think, and, and ultimately, you know, maybe it's possible with the root system that exists and, where, and how sharply that branch drops, and sometimes it's just not, and we deal with that, right? We deal with that. We take those limitations and we deal with it. Would a different container uh, be able to execute that? I don't know. This doesn't have a lip on the container, probably because of that drop branch. Maybe this is the maximum that it could accept and handle. These are all of the things that when we talk about ideal and perfection and really sort of these small nuances of how we get there, if we can get it, great. If we can't, we accept it, right? And when we accept it, maybe one of the touch points that could exist is to just slightly cover that touch point. Use that foliage not as a way to block, but as a way to distract or not fully illustrate some of those things that we would ideally have but can't have. And this is where foliage starts to become the flexible sort of paint on the paintbrush that we can utilize to really maximize, just like the branch on, on Scott's hemlock. I thought that was a masterful use of that branch. Right? There could be a little, a, a little bit of um, ability, if we're limited, to be able to use branches in that way on this tree as well. There's heavy visual weight right now that looks like the tree wants to tip over and that you're holding it up with that branch. Hmm. I don't see that. I don't see that. And here's why I don't see that. I do. Notice how strong this root on the left is. This is the most dominant root on this exposed root structure. Anytime that we start to push that asymmetry and we start to lean off to the edge, if this is weak over here, then definitively that branch would start to look like it was structurally giving more stability. But this is strong. For, for what the roots are offering, we know that there's some feminine discussion in this. And I wonder if the container isn't creating some of that visual weight as much as, right? Would a more delicate container decrease that, that feeling a little bit? Would it touch on some of that space a little bit more? This is interesting, and this is where the dynamic of the container really starts to add to a composition. And I think this is a beautiful container, and this is an absolutely stellar quality of tree, and it's had a lot of time and attention put into it. And I think the idea is evolving on this piece of material. Going back to the very beginning of what Ryan was talking about regarding the pot and uh, Roger's comment about this branch. I don't know if you guys can see this. This tree is as far over that way as possible, and this lip barely fits between these two. It might have even pushed them apart. So this, uh, uh, as Ryan was saying, um, you might not have had the uh, the choice to have any other kind of lip configuration. Mm. Yeah, that roots right, right, roots still, right up against that. To edge, jump in it? again, uh, other ways around that also, uh, you can get creative and do some type of rock planning. You could find a crescent shaped pot for it, something mm. a little more natural in that way. Yeah, that would, would allow be nice. some space for that branch to fall down. That's one option. That's uh, true. Yeah, it's good. You're definitely right about that container and how that limits it completely from having any space. I think they got it as far as they could over. It's touching each edge of the pot, so there's no more room. Unless you tilted the tree up, and that would kind of change the, the flow. So I think the angle is nice already how it is. Just the container is limiting that from happening. Yeah, and the exposed root really gives it the chance to be wild, too. Yeah. Great tree. Great tree, great pot. Yeah, there's all kinds of options out there. I don't don't have an exact image in mind yet, but yeah. So, Roger, you asked if you'd use a, a shallower and wider pot. So if we already have that issue of that width sort of impeding us and we went wider, it's going to create more negative space on that side of the tree that, that has the space, and so it's going to offset. It would look a little funky, I think. I think it's more... You know, I think what Matt touched on, you've got this insinuation. Neagari, the exposed root style, is a discussion of sort of that soil eroding away from the base. Typically, that's happening on a hillside in order for that soil to be able to erode. So if you want to go literal in terms of the story, you already have that story being told, and you could execute that if that was the decision. If we wanted to keep it in that more formal in that more formal state, a thinner wall to the pot, right? And that's already, that pot's not a massive wall. It doesn't have a lip. But there is there are containers that have even a thinner wall to be able to potentially open up that negative space and maybe touch on a little bit of negative space. But again, if it's maxed out and that's where we want to be with the design, then we start to look at how do we use foliage mass to be able to compensate and, and maybe take away from that obvious contact. You're up, Bobby. We both picked it. Come on. Well, 
So the the pot definitely sticks out on this tree for me. It's it's pretty bright and this, this is obviously supposed to be a really old tree. So I would have I would have gone with a, a more masculine shape and a, a much more muted color to go with the large. Uh, it's it's a really nice tree and it, it's got a nice future ahead of it. But I I think it needs quite a few more years before it it gets entered in the show again. It, these these pads really need to fill in all throughout the tree to. Uh, to balance it more. It also has the bar branches down low that, that really try to avoid with uh, the design. Um, the overall health of the tree, it's got some, some needles uh, all throughout it that are, that are browning. Uh, I'd like to see those all nice and healthy green needles so then when it changes for the fall, it's, it's that beautiful yellow color instead of brown mixed with yellow. Um, yeah, just other little details like all these gins, they could be cleaned up, um, made, made to look a little prettier, uh, sulfured. The carving is a little rough. You can see a lot of tool marks on them. So anytime we're doing gins, we, and especially when you put the tree in the show, you don't want to see tool marks on the tree. You don't want to see any human, human movements that are, that are put on there. Uh, nice things about it, though. The base is really, really strong base, uh, mossed really well, great taper to the tree. So yeah, I, I think it was just uh, a little early to have it in the show, and the pot is probably my biggest, biggest uh, problem with the, the composition here. Well said, yeah, uh, pretty much touched on a lot of points that I also, uh, would have, uh, yeah, the first thing that stood out to me was that bar branch, and I mean, if you were to get rid of them, which one would you guys want to see gone, left or right? I would agree, because the flow of the tree is obviously more towards the right, has that uh, strong lean to it, and even the top is directing us over there, so that tells us you got a nice strong branch down low. I'd even like to see that branch thicken up some more to balance out with the size of the trunk, so just let this branch grow for a while, a couple of years at least. Just let it build strength and speed up the process that way. And uh, yeah, really fill out some of these pads to balance out with the massive trunk would be would be nice, but great tree, bark, taper, that's all, all there already, so just time. Uh, very historical piece of material. A masa for a cow a tree been in cultivation as a bonsai a long time, showing the age with that bark. Base on the left side gives us the ability to move to the right, maybe even make a bigger commitment to the right, right? So we can't, you can't accept what the tree just, you can't just say, okay, it's, it's leaning here, so this is how we have to go. If we wanted to, we could pull the design back if we didn't have that base, right? But it has that base, so we can push in this direction, but there's a bigger thematic around this, right? If we're talking about this kind of sparseness of branching, and we're also talking about this kind of thinness of branching, this is actually very appropriate to larch in the natural environment, okay? But when we see larch in the natural environment with these characteristics, a lot of times we could say we could ideally thicken everything. We could make it more proportional. We could make it more traditional. Or we could say this is what we have. This is what the tree has. How do we maximize what it has to execute that environmental sort of insinuation or that characteristic of the alpine? And when we see larch with this kind of age, this kind of movement, this kind of height, I think what's really been effectively sort of executed in the design is the smallness, the, the, the limited size of the apical region, okay? This would be very alpine. Larch coming from alpine, almost a, almost a pointed top even on mature trees in the alpine for larch. But when we start to talk about that smaller apical sort of creation and executing the alpine environment, the other thing that we would see with larch when they're carrying this kind of aesthetic, this kind of thinness of branches, is we would see super steep, snow-loaded, drooping, dropping branches, right? And so we have a very lateral, almost like a formal formality to this lateral branching, which is a very young indication of larch, but we've got all of the indications in the tree from bark, base, trunk, et cetera, that says I'm actually quite a bit older. And if I'm quite a bit older and I'm a larch with that size of an apex, my branches inherently would be carrying through that thematic. So if we drop those down, and not just drop them down, make that commitment, boom, these big, huge, dropping, long, really, steep angles to it, all of a sudden it would change the entire nuance of the tree and you would feel that alpine. You would see that characteristic of larch. And it's already been, again, touched on in the apex, carried forward in the trunk and the branches just need to follow suit, 
right? So we have everything here present that it would take to make a really wonderful alpine insinuation of a larch, and we've got age that is very hard to get on a larch in North America unless they're collected, and there's not a lot of great collected larch that exist. So inside of that, maximizing the characteristics of the tree, taking what it's giving us and utilizing them to the best of our ability in terms of design would just take this tree to that next level, and it's got it already. It's just a matter of identifying it, understanding that environment that we're reflecting, and doing that aesthetic adjustment to be able to maximize that quality. Yeah, being the fourth person in this group is, is hard to say anything really. Uh, you guys covered it all. Uh, just to jump off of uh, what Ryan was talking about, these are alpine trees really. We don't, we don't see them in flatlands, do we? Um, what does an old larch look like? Um, most of the, the younger trees even have an upward branch pattern, even moderate age trees, the ones that I've seen. I honestly have not seen many really ancient um, larch. Um, and so when, when I work with larch, I, I think I, um, I have a little work to do because I, ha I haven't seen them and I need to. <laughs> um, but, uh, but one thing I, I, I know um, is that even trees that are deciduous, this is a deciduous conifer, um, they don't necessarily need foliage on there to have a snow load. They don't uh, necessarily, especially if you've had uh, snow on a, on, on a branch uh, over, over many, many winters, it is going to go down. Um, uh, it doesn't even need uh, a snow load. You think of some of the really old deciduous trees. Um, weight of a branch can bring uh, eventually. You think of some of the old oaks in California. And These are tumbling branches. They didn't start that way. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm with Ryan on that one. This, this is kind of lateral, and it, it kind of confuses things uh, to me. I, I'm not quite sure what, uh, you know, is this an old tree? Where is it from? Um, uh, I think there could be a little more unity there. This is incredibly old tree. Look at the bark on this. It goes all the way to the top. It's amazing. It's an amazing piece of right? material. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about just personal preferences, right? We've, been, we've all been saying different things up here. Um, so you get a good look at that, don't you? <laughs> um, what, one thing that I um, look for um, is, is naturalness in the gin. And these gins, um, the, the majority of these are about an inch and a half, two inches long. A uh, little, little bit more variation in the length of gins um, uh, might uh, add a little bit of flavor uh, to this one. Uh, the pot, I... <laughs> Uh, I think I, I think I agree with Bobby on that one. Um, it can be fun to have a, a bold pot. It can be. I think uh, this tree, maybe at the, at this age, at this level of development, it does need. I, I agree with uh, Matt and Bobby on the just sort of the density of the of the, of the, the the branching. We don't need necessarily a lot of length here. This is again an alpine tree. Uh, what Ryan was talking about. We don't really need long branch. We can have a much smaller apex. Maybe still rounded, but it's very very small, almost pointed. Um, but the pot, you know, uh, is, is, is a way to, um, to give a nod to the part of the tree that we really like. You know, do we, do we want this to be a, a flavorful tree? Do we want it to, to have uh, uh, some kind of uh, charismatic uh, uh, personality that swings one way or another? And we can do that with a pot. There's often quite a range in terms of what we can plant the, uh, uh, the tree in. Um, this makes it quite playful. I don't feel like this is a playful tree. This is this is a this is a tree we should contemplate. This is a tree that, that we should that we should slow down with, um, especially in a, with a few years in in, in, in age and the in, in the maturity in in, in the pads. That's going to happen, and then this pot I think is going to be way off. That reminds me of uh, in 2012 in Santa Clara at the GSBF convention. You made a statement. You said spruce. Spruce should feel like the snow is falling. And that really had an impact on me when you said that. I was like, wow, I've never thought about bonsai as a sound. It's a it golden should, statement. It should feel, it's a golden <laughs> statement. <laughs> I thought that was monumental. And in, as you're talking about this, it just feels like, yes, it, it should feel as if the snow is falling. And yeah, it, it, I, I agree. But I think there's also another thing to touch on because the color of the container is ostentatious for sure, particularly when the larch is in leaf and you've got that green and that yellow combination. It's very bold, it's very abrupt. But 
you also have to think in terms of deciduous trees, at what season are you hoping to maximize the aesthetic value, right? This is true for flowering and fruiting trees as well. Are you touching on the fruit or are you touching on the flower? Are you touching on the spring growth? Or are you touching on the winter silhouette? Or are you touching on the summer, sort of summer fall? And then are you touching on that fall color? And there's, there's a, a play on color that can happen. You've got a yellow container and you know the larch is gonna go yellow. So now you've got this analogy of colors where they're very close on the color wheel, different hues of yellow. And the aesthetic of that fall change might be interesting. We're looking at it in green, but there is something that could happen when this starts to turn yellow that either may be magical or horrifically ugly. And we would have to see it at that point to know. And you would have to have, when you do this, the intentionality of when you show this tree, it has that characteristic that you intentionally chose that container for. This is when we start to get into that really nuanced ability to be able to communicate what we're trying to achieve, right? Uh, shape of the container. If we're trying to maximize the verticality and show this very tall alpine tree, decreasing that depth is going to show more of that height than the tree. Extending the length is going to show more of that height than the tree. And there's room to play. Like Mike, Michael was saying, there's a lot of different nuances that we can start to apply to the container selection to maximize whatever component of this tree we're hoping that the viewer takes home with them, right? So container really drives home a lot of those sort of more thoughtful, cerebral concepts about the composition. Any questions, comments? Kevin, coming at you. Right behind you, Kevin. You, you, you got lectured. Yeah, a lot already. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got to be a fun hey, He's trained. He's trained. We've got, we've, got him, we've got him programmed. So with the concept of the pot, and if you guys could touch on the fact of, like, outside the pot, I'd, I'm getting there. <laughs> with the concept, Talk louder. Okay. With the concept of the pot, and the aspect of without a pot, slab planting or otherwise, as Michael and other people have discussed, how do you guys think that would take away from the age or give age more so and more uh, the aesthetic of truly wild tree? Could you discuss that? Yeah, personally, I would, for this tree, would want to stick with some kind of container, something a little more masculine even than this one, since it does have a round, playful shape. A uh, softer shape, and this is a more of a masculine tree in my mind, so I'd want to go with some kind of rectangle with age. And pretty simple, too. It's a simple tree. You don't need to get too crazy with the container on this, I don't think. Too, just the tree is what you want to stand out, mainly. I think, so again, when we talk about using a more formalized shape of container, then you're talking about the nuances of the container driving home the concept, right? But when we start to shift to a slab or a more organic form of the container, and you know, when you look at this, the, the, the formalized form of the container, you've got color, you've got shape that's touching on the concept of the design. When you start to go more natural, more slab-like, you're starting to hint and insinuate at the environment. You're leaving less to the imagination. There's nothing wrong with that. It's very powerful. It touches on that more organic, sort of natural environmental form. And so it starts to, the question is what what are you trying to accomplish? If you're trying to show natural, right, to put this on a more natural slab and really carry through that aesthetic of where large come from and how they look in an environment that has the characteristics of this tree, that would be very powerful, It'd be very compelling, it would be very identifiable. But then to be able to touch on if color, if fall color is what you want, if touching on the spring, really bright flush of growth is what you want, if the winter silhouette is what you want, and if you want the tree to pop, then you would choose a different color of container. If you want the tree to maybe have the volume turned down a little bit and be a little bit more quiet, a little bit more contemplative, the, the sound of snow falling, then the, then the color of the container would change. If you move more towards a gray and winter silhouette, touching on the gray hues of the bark, you start to create that analogy again, but you're t doing it in the winter silhouette, and now you feel that snow, you feel that quietness, you feel that solitude. If you started to shift more towards a reddish hue, then you're contrasting the green, you're starting to touch on some minor accents in the, in the bark, and the tree starts to really stand out and be a lot louder, but you need to show that tree in leaf to maximize that contrast. So we start to see the elements of the container really dictating and, and carrying forward the conversation we're hoping the tree evokes. That's where bonsai is so much more intentional than just, hey, if we put this in a container that looks like this, it'll be better. Mm, let's go a little bit farther than that, right? Let's, let's think a little bit deeper than that. Let's start to look at how ceramics impact or how that choice of a slab impacts the way that that composition is conveyed to the viewer. Mm, like it, yeah. Um, I know you, you want to change this out pretty quick. Um, so I, I made enough comments about the, about the pot. Uh, just, just one quick one. 
um, about uh, about showing. Um, now, uh, when I gave my critique, Scott Elser admitted that uh, most, uh, probably 90% of the displays in there were put together piecemeal at the time. They weren't considered. Uh, so Ryan was talking about intention. So not just um, pot tree. That's really significant. We need to start there. But then, please don't do what you did to Scott. Uh, take your, <laughs> take, take, take a, take a year and figure this out. Take two years, figure out what goes with this. What am I gonna, what am I gonna offer as a, um, as an entire intention, as a, as a complete display that says something that that that's an imagination. Um, it certainly starts with tree, starts with pot, or the other way around. Um, but uh, but then, well, what does it all link with? Uh, so help out people like Scott who are trying to put together these shows <laughs> so that they have more meaning. What time do we go till? Oh, awesome. Awesome. I like this. I'm learning. I'm learning. Being up here with these guys and getting to hear... You know, as professionals, we're not, we don't exist on an island, and we can get sort of locked inside of our own echo chamber of our bonsai practice. This is what I think. This is what I do. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. And sometimes when you're educating people as a professional, you have to make those stances. You have to establish that platform, right? Otherwise, your students don't have any sort of anchor to base the, the building of their knowledge on. And you've got to establish that fundamental knowledge so that once you have that, you always have a safe place to come back to when you start to experiment and it stops working, right? But as professionals, we also have to work very hard to break down a lot of the constructs that we create around the formality of our knowledge so that we don't get locked in and we don't get sedentary and that we don't stop evolving. And these kinds of exercises where you guys are getting a lot of different perspectives as practitioners, this is also equally as valuable, if not more important for us as professionals to continue evolving and recognizing what other people are thinking about bonsai that we can pull into our practice and continue to evolve the way that we're sharing knowledge, the way that we're executing compositions. Because as a professional, if the breadth of your work is not extremely wide, you start to neck down the impact that you can have in terms of distribution of knowledge. And that's where these, this, this type of thing isn't very common. There hasn't been very many super critiques that I've been a part of in eight years being back from Japan, and I've never seen it happen in Japan. Uh, this is very interesting to be a part of this. You guys are getting to share on something pretty special today. Me? OK. I guess uh, Bat, Matt and I both picked this tree. It's a really good example of a, a Japanese maple, everything from the trunk having no no major scars there's one up here that's still healing but it's not right in front so that's that's a big plus for the tree um the, the elegant move the movement of the tree really really suits the species well i one thing i would like to see is maybe a little more separation a little more negative space in between some of these areas to break it up and make it make it look a little bit older because it is supposed to be a really big old maple um, I really like the pot choice, shape, color. I think they did a great job with that. Um, the, it's been a tough summer, so some of these leaves are a little burnt, but maybe, maybe a little more shade, especially knowing it was going to be shown just to make sure everything looks as pristine as possible because uh, that, that fall color change is one of the great things about these species. So really try and do everything you can to protect those. Uh, watering shade definitely helps. Very good. Yeah, I don't think there's a, a whole lot of negative critique on this tree, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, yeah, very good taper, very few cuts. It's hard to see right now, but it looks like it has pretty decent ramification too, nice and full. Nice and delicate, good taper within the branch structure also, which is something you don't notice a whole lot uh, in the United States. But now we're starting to get better and improve our skills, so we'll have hopefully more and more deciduous trees uh, of this caliber in the future. And another, uh, yeah, we see tons of conifer, tons of nice collected conifer all over the place, but it'd be nice to, nice to have more deciduous material to, to work with. Uh, vine maple is another one that I really like that we're starting to play around with and have been for a few years. You know, Michael has, I'm sure Ryan has, I know Bobby and I have. So that's another uh, good one that has some potential, I think. And 
it's hard to find something like that uh, out in nature, but <laughs> some some large trunks do exist. And in the future, I think there'll be some pretty pretty nice trees. Yeah. Also, the the combination of the container and once that fall color comes into play with that, it'll be a nice con nice subtle contrast for it. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, old tree. We know the uh, history of this tree actually. Um, this tree was grown by seed uh, 70 years ago in this country. This is not an import. Um, large, mature tree. These trees can... Who started it, Michael? What's that? Do we know who started it? Uh, I think Dennis does. <laughs> is he here? Is Dennis here? Dennis, do you want to talk? Wait. Nelson wait, Dennis. Wait. Did I get that right about 70 years ago? Oh. Is that right? Nelson Dennis. There we go. Nelson, Nelson Dennis, Dennis, everybody. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Shout out, right. to, shout out no, to Nelson. Fast enough. Uh, so what, what is that, 40s? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. 1948. 1948. Wow. 1948, wow. dedication. S when did you take on ownership, Dennis? 25 years ago. Okay. If you've had a deciduous tweet 25 years, you, uh, you own something of it. Uh, but any tree like this um, that has that kind of age uh, can make you feel pretty small. Uh, this is one thing that deciduous trees do. They, they can be almost a little hard to, some people I think, uh, I've noticed this, I've talked with a lot of people who have trouble connecting with deciduous trees because uh, it doesn't feel like there's enough engagement with them. You know, we just kind of appreciate them. And that's, uh, I think that's a feature of what they are. Uh, uh, they can make you feel small. They can also make you feel more connected uh, because uh, Dennis didn't fully create this. He had a big hand in keeping it going and improving it. This might not be here. <laughs> Certainly, it might have had a lot of loss of branch. Uh, deciduous trees are, are, are trickier to handle uh, than, than conifers in some care respects. Um, so there's huge nods to the several people who have had this tree. It's three now, are you the number three? Is that right, did I remember the four? Second, oh, you're only second, okay, all right. Um, so deciduous trees uh, of, of any significant age um, communicate, communicate, community. Um, and ultimately, so do um, the conifers. Um, but we see that and we feel that more with deciduous trees. So that's, that's something kind of unique and special about a tree of this uh, vintage. Um, I, uh, I like the pot shape. I think it could be a little bit larger. So I'll, I'll disagree with uh, what's been said so far. A l little bit larger, I think even the lip could be a little bit more significant. This is a, a tree with a pretty uh, large, uh, large base. Um, one thing you'll notice, if, if you work with deciduous trees, if you like uh, growing young ones, I hope you do, because we need more of them, um, and there aren't many professionals who are going to do this. I don't do much of it. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no return, really. Um, but but uh, growing a few uh, nice deciduous trees uh, from something that's pretty young is your gift to the next generation. Take a look at what, what happened down here. If you want to give to the next generation something of a significant trunk size, look at this low branch here. If you create... Oops, I almost took off a few branches there. Sorry, Dennis. Um, if you create your trees with some low branching or multiple trunks down low, you end up with a tachyagari, which is monstrous. That's this area right here. This is in the bari. Tachyagari is your flare. You only get that if you have these lower areas. If all the branches are up there, it's going to be skinny, very little taper. You might have a nice nabari, but you won't have that. Nice, nice. Um, so I got the pleasure of seeing this at the national show in New York. I transported it, and I also tried to not break off a lot of branches. Um, and for me, this was the show winner at the national show. It won Best Deciduous at the national show, as did Dennis's Birch in 2016. And I thought uh, amongst all of the, again, touching on sort of the quality of the species and the nuances of the species, and thinking about Dennis's approach to bonsai and knowing how intentional it is, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be learned and observed from this tree. First and foremost, you can create this big, massive nabari that almost looks artificial. And there were a few maples in the national show that had that big massive nabari, but that's not really, 
doesn't touch on sort of that, um, the essence of Japanese maple, the delicacy, the smoothness, the feminine nature of the Japanese maple. Obviously, everybody's touched on sort of the scar scarless, flawless trunk. This is very much a, co a convention that we accept as a, as a um, sort of discussion of the craftsmanship that's gone into it, the prolonged vision of the final product. And this tree has a wonderful trunk, this branch, very beautiful. Now, there's one reason that this didn't win the national show, and it's because of this branch right here in the front that sort of hides and, and cuts your view of that trunk and that base of that tree. And, and there's a question inside of that is, do you cut that off and open up that scar that's been so diligently worked at to have that fluid, flawless, very smooth trunk that we value in Japanese maples? Right? And, I, and, it, and, and that's a question, and that's a decision for the owner. I, I don't know that I would. I don't know that at this point, in this age and maturity of the tree, that that would be a decision I would be willing to make just to satisfy some convention of judging, right? And even with that, it was still chosen as the best deciduous. And in my mind, it still carries forward the qualities that make it the best in show. But let's talk about that. So we've got this wonderful fluid movement, very soft, very scarless all the way through the tree. But the bigger and most important issue is the transition from the trunk to the primary branches all of them in wonderful locations. Very difficult with Japanese maple to not get threes and fours in terms of branches originating from one location causing inverse swelling over the course of time and still have this kind of branch distribution where you've got a canopy that really reflects that natural feeling. Okay, all of the branches extremely well placed. Taper from the trunk to the primary branching out to the secondaries that originate from the primary branching out to the tips and here's the thing. Dennis has the technique to be able to execute a much more dense, highly ramified crown. There's no doubt about it. He knows what he's doing and he knows how to do it. So when you see the choice of the ramification being there, but being delicate, being slender, being fine, and also having the density that it currently has, you still get into the tree. You're allowed to sort of move through the crown. That's an intentionality and that's a choice in terms of the design of the tree where if you're going nuts and bolts and the goal is grow ramification, 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 and this thing is super dense, you lose all of that delicacy and all of that fluidity and the movement of the trunk and the transition and the smoothness and it takes away. It starts to function as an idea or a technique. It doesn't execute artistic concepts as well. And this tree from the base, through the trunk, through the primary, through the secondary, to the tertiary carries forward a concept that it has a lot of continuity, a lot of intentionality, and it's about as well executed of a maple as I think I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of maples in Japan that are beautiful. There's a lot of artists in Japan that have that level of intentionality, but there is a very technical sort of standard that's set by the Kokfu that creates that box. More ramification is better, more ramification is better, more ramification is better, and I don't know that I agree with that because this is proof that that delicate intentionality of seeking out that transition and that density and that technique that gives you this, where you're still able to enjoy and really see that intentionality in the creation. That's an awesome ringtone. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> it's good. It's a good ringtone. It's solid. Very upbeat. Per 10 in the morning, Roger. Thank you. So, so when I was, as I was walking through the national show and we were kind of looking at all of the trees and you look at the deciduous trees and we get lost in those nuts and bolts. And, and Michael actually said this a long time ago. I might have still been an apprentice in Japan. Uh, or I might have just come back and he said, you know, walking through the Coke Fu is like eating uh, a steady diet of meat and potatoes. So heavy, so technical, so verbose in terms of the styling of the trees. And sometimes you want some veggies. Sometimes you want a little bit of salad. And this is really one of those trees that when you're, when you're experiencing all of that power and that technique that's applied and mastered over the course of time and what we've come to appreciate in terms of craftsmanship. And then you see somebody just deviate from that a little bit and make an intentional decision to carry on the nuance of the tree. It's something really special and something that really stands out. And I think this tree embodies a lot of different concepts that are worth looking at at a very close sort of prolonged period of time when it's in the exhibition. Enjoy all of that, because this tree is really reaching a pinnacle of aesthetic that, that is meant to be enjoyed, meant to be shared, and meant to be appreciated. Got a question for you. Hi, I understand that um, one of the things that bothered some of the judges was not, was not that there was a branch, but that there was a U in the branch. Um, and I just would like to get all your perspectives about that. Right up here on this front branch? No, I'm talking about this area. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, um, that doesn't really bother me at all with this tree. The, it's not not just a straight view. It, it's it's got the flow and movement and undulations along that line that I think go very well with the species. So, if it yeah, that that shape doesn't really bother me too much. If it were to create a full circle or something like that, it would probably bother me. But yeah, that seems pretty natural the way it is. I think if you want to deconstruct this tree on that level, that you shouldn't do bonsai. Nice. <laughs> Any more questions or comments on this tree? No? Outstanding. Outstanding tree, Dennis. Yeah. Just, yeah, just really, really amazing. You know, and the other thing, if, yeah. And this is not, this isn't a, a, a plug for Mariah, but Dennis came out and did the podcast, uh, our asymmetry podcast with us and shared some of his ideas about how he handles deciduous material to be able to achieve what he achieves in terms of his technique and thought process and approach. And if you haven't listened to it, listen to it, because it'll give you a lot of insight into that tree. And it's a very special approach that he outlined for everybody. Just one last comment about that tree, uh, about that low branch. Um, that might be something that if the tree was younger, you might have uh, made a little cut, moved the angle, possibly. At a certain point, you begin to forgive things uh, in a tree as if they were a grandfather, that there's some things about your grandfather that bother <laughs> you. Yeah. You're not going to change it. <laughs> and if you tried, you'd make a real mess. <laughs> That tree's the same. <laughs> Could you guys start by uh, telling us what yes. kind of tree this is? Yeah. Yeah. It's a pear. Asian uh, pear. What kind of, is it, is it Asian? I don't know. That's what the sign says. Asian pear? Yeah. Dwarf, dwarf. dwarf Asian pear. Woo. Good this heavens. Monster. This is a monster. Want to go for it? No. No. <laughs> anyway. You no. go ahead. You're there. I'm here. You, right are here. The, yeah, you, you took the initiative. This is all you. All right. So I grew up in upstate New York, uh, where there were a lot of pears. We didn't have Asian pears. We had some things that were almost as awful to eat um, that they that would self seed in the in the cow pastures, and I would avidly dig them up, and not terribly successfully. Very clay soil and had these massive uh, root structures that uh, had had <laughs> that you really struggled with to try and uh, get out of the ground. Um, so I, I have uh, I have pear envy here. That was many years ago. I, I trust I would do better these days. Um, but um, pear are rare for bonsai. I have a student who's working on one up in Seattle, which is one of the best pears I've ever seen. But it's, it's, uh, it's nowhere near at this level. It's going to take probably 15 years to get here or more. They don't ramify very fast. Uh, so when you, when you look at a tree and you say, gosh, this isn't very well ramified, well, you don't know pears very well. They take a, they take a, a lot of patience and love. Um, if you grow them hard, you can uh, you can get some multiple flushes, but it's not easy. Um, this tree has some real nice qualities about it. When the show was originally set up, it was uh, it was set up with the wrong flow. <laughs> and then when I went in there to do the uh, critique this morning, I, I saw that they had switched it around. It is a right flow; it's not a left flow. Everybody see that the front is now toward you. Uh, the tree seems a little leggier than um, than one would. Uh, uh, want perhaps for a tree of this uh, scale and and taper, you might want to bring that in just just a hair perhaps. Uh, but those are just uh, you know basic uh, comments. Um, I think uh, one thing that's really wonderful about this tree uh, that many of us do really badly in the West, and that is it has a lot of branches. Many of us try and simplify our trees to the point where there's no complexity, especially at this scale. When you go down even further, down to Shoheen, you have a lot of bar branches. You have people cutting those off, and pretty soon you have a tree with two and a half branches. Um, and it doesn't work anymore. You go to Japan, and we've been talking about the Kokofu show and other shows uh, here and there. There's bar branches everywhere. Because at certain scales, you need them. Or if it's a collected tree, you don't have a choice. Uh, these are some of the... Um, some of the, the myths that, that used to be guidelines that maybe we can now recognize as problems. It's a really nice tree. It has a, has a simple uh, little curve to it. Uh, it's an easy to appreciate tree. If, if you come to my seasonal classes and you have a, a tree with an S curve in it, um, you're showing the door. However, this is an old tree, just like what we're talking about with the maple. We forgive the tree for having a bit of simplicity. We don't have to have real active trees. 
Some of the most amazingly powerful bonsai experiences you can have are with formal uprights or nearly formal uprights. This idea that a tree has to be dynamic or that dynamic is better than majesty or dignity, which is what we get with more simple trees. That, that's one that, that we learn, that you have to experience. Go see good bonsai yards. You don't necessarily have to travel the world these days to see that. You can see that in this country. Um, sorry, that was sort of off. It didn't really have That's to good. do with this, but That's good. Do you think that yeah. do you think that that is uh, a learned or evolved appreciation? Oh, it's learned. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you agree? I, I, I do because obviously when you start doing bonsai, the more exciting a tree is, the more excited you are by it. But it's like as you see so many exciting trees, sometimes the most simple form starts to become the most attractive and sort of seductive in terms of, oh man, I'm tired of looking at all of the twists and turns and rotations and you know, acute angles. And then you get this very just simple, the hemlock in the exhibition is another perfect example of that. Just, just this really well executed, charming tree in there. And it's, it's like, it's such a nice relief because there is a lot of power in that show and, and having that diversity, but also you know, elevating your sort of, the, the trees that you've seen and experienced to the point where you can really appreciate simplicity over complexity or appreciate it as much as complexity and both of those hold the same value. I think is a, I think that's an exp I think that's learned as Michael said I think it's also an experience. And for this tree, you know, again Michael said it's hard to ramify a pair. This is this is a lot of time with a lot of hard work and a lot of technique put into it, but I think it's also a lot of acceptance acceptance of the movement of the trunk, acceptance of the tree's quality and characteristic, acceptance of the fact that a lot of the structure is the same diameter, and it is what it is. It's a, it's a pear, and a pear is, is very difficult to cultivate as bonsai, but when you take the totality of all of those simple components, right, where if you, if you had a tree that had really dynamic movement and some of the same things that would really stand out, when you've got this with the technique and the knowledge of the species, and appreciating bonsai on that higher level is understanding how difficult is this to achieve. It's very difficult. This is very prolonged amount of really uh, dedicated time to be able to get a pair to this point, you start to appreciate those nuances of those quieter trees because you know what it took. You know what it took, you know how difficult that was. And this tree really, in my mind, in the, in, in the show, there's several trees that show that fruitfulness of that time and that patience and that understanding of the species. And this was one that really executes that quiet simplicity of, of a really monumental uh, bonsai practice. All right. Guess I'm up. So uh, I really just wanted to point out the I really appreciate the pairing of the container with this tree. I think it's a you know really nice pairing. nice <laughs> soft glass. What's that? Pairing. Pa oh, that was, that was a lot. Uh, I thought you, you meant you to do me. it. You got me. I thought you meant to do it, but then you kept moving, and Bobby you came back me. to this. Good. This good. Because the Golden Statements thing kind of set it up. You set it up for me, though. Well, so. yeah, but I mean, you set it up for him, right? Just return the favor, man. Yeah. Touche. We're playing hockey here. Uh, <laughs> Passing the puck. Yeah, I think it's a really nice container, well, you know, balanced with the tree and the, the power of the trunk, and it still has some elegance to it with the indented corners there, and the nice feet have some nice detail in them. It's not, it doesn't look like a super old pot, but eventually that's going to get some patina on it once it's uh, used for a long time. So just keep it in here as long as you can. And another thing I don't think anybody's pointed out yet are... There's a few scars down low, and I don't, I don't have any experience with pear personally, and I don't know how they heal from big cuts like that, or if they will, but it would be nice if you get a close look. They're not, they don't stand out, which is good. They still look like they have some age, and they're in the process of healing, so once those do heal, if they do, it'll really be outstanding. Trunk there. Uh, and then uh, again, uh, pointing out the top of the tree, uh, the overall leggyness of things, as Michael was pointing out if you you know especially we look at trees from all sides not just the front we want to work on them equally so how far forward this the canopy is coming at you is, seems a little extreme to me so i would yeah want to reduce that section a little bit and try to try to make it a little less strong on top to kind of balance out the growth yeah this is a definitely a fun tree to look at you could look at it for quite a while there's there's a few few things that it needs to improve on still before it becomes the ideal design everybody's touched on that healing up those um, top having that over a little more I think some of these branches that kind of just shoot up maybe kind of 
some of them are really nice and wild, but I think maybe a few of them could go to give it a little more, a uh, little more space because it's kind of uh, just all one big silhouette right now. Um, yeah, being nitpicky so nice, is our job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a nice tree, a really really fun tree to to look at, and I I could sit and watch look at this tree for a long time, and yeah, they, they did get a job, but. Yeah, I just feel like this area down here too is is a little heavy. Maybe take out just a little bit, not not too much, but just a a little clarification here and there on the tree could could go a long ways. I think same with the canopy. It wouldn't be any major reduction, just a you know lighter cutback. I mean, stronger than light cutback, but we're not going to be taking out any major sections. Just finding a safe spot to to gradually work that back in over you know a couple of years, maybe even. Just one technical point: um, If you do have scars, such as we see here uh, on a on a tree, and you're trying to close it, you might try something called kirikuchi, which is uh, a green. It's one of the latex-based uh, uh, liquids. Uh, it's greenish olive. Uh, Jonas uh, of uh, bonsai tonight is selling it. Uh, I started using that in Japan and uh, have continued using it here, and I've seen some results I've never seen before. I'm not sure what's in it. It might be GA3, gibberellic acid, but I've seen. It, is that what it has in it, do you think? Yeah, that's what I thought. I've closed things I've never been able to close before. Uh, wounds on chochibai close in a year, like a half inch. It's just crazy. You can over-apply it, and you can get a big, big nasty callus, but, you, but then you can close things like ginkgo, which are almost impossible to close. So it's just a technical point. You might, might give that a whirl. Maybe even re-scarring the edges before you do that might further increase the ability for that to heal. And if you have to grow a new finger, it'll help with that, too. <laughs> Wash your hands before you eat after that It might stuff. be a bigger finger, though. Yeah, Put too right. much on. <laughs> <laughs> Reverse taper. Diving deep into bone psychometry here, right? I don't know. Is there any questions? You guys good with that? Asian pear. Love it. You guys getting something out of this? A lot of information being thrown your way, yeah. Keep up the questions, too. All you need is popcorn. Well, <laughs> there, there's a bonsai pot fountain over there with some soft drinks for you, so. Yeah, do we have any questions right now? <laughs> I think this, this in, the, in the exhibition, this was just right here. I think we're close. Yep. Uh, are we close? Are we close, Craig? Cool. Sort of like at a... This shot out. About yeah, 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 it's 8 o'clock-ish, 7 o'clock-ish. It's a really interesting tree. This was one of the most intriguing trees in the show for me. Engelman, 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 Engelman spruce. spruce. Good job, Reed. Picea, Engelman, I... Um, <laughs> is this, uh, Thank you. <laughs> where, where, where do you think... Is this a Pacific Northwest Engelman, I'm assuming? Because there's a big difference between Rocky Mountain Engelmans and Pacific Northwest Engelmans. They, they tend to behave a little bit differently. I don't know if you've noticed that, Michael, or if, you have, if there's any specifics to that. The needle quality seems different. Needle quality is very different, right? Back, back budding potential or behavior is, is, is interesting. It's nuanced. We have a lot of regional differences in our native conifers. If you look at the, um, the mountain hemlock from Vancouver Island, it almost looks like a different plant from the one in the Cascades here. The needle shape is different. The color is entirely different. The Cascades hemlock is uh, bluish, uh, kind of a ghostly kind of color. And from the Vancouver area, it's a, it's a wider needle and it's really dark green. The bark is the bark is very different too. It I is. Think. Yeah, you get that almost like yeah. more plated pinish bark on the Vancouver Island. You get more flaky bark in the Cascades. It's very. Those regional differences are a big part of bonsai in, in Japan. You talk about needle differences, et cetera. It's, it, it's interesting to look at that. Uh, as I was saying, this is one of the most intriguing trees that uh, is in the exhibition um, for me. It's, it, we were talking just a little while ago about fairly simple trees. Look at the, look at the deadwood up here. This, this is such a quiet tree that, that this, is, this is a main feature that you, that, that you look at, that you... Um, immediately appreciate about the tree. It almost has a spiral design to it. 
canopies over here. You could almost be confused about the flow, except the canopy really kind of gives you a pretty, pretty good clue there. Um, we don't expect um, a, a really clean pad on an Engelman. In fact, I think if we wire it all out um, really cleanly, it tends to look a little strange, just a little bit looser, uh, which is nice. It, it, it has its own kind of nature. It has its own feeling, which uh, I, I feel we, we shouldn't try and ram it into like a, an azo spruce, uh, which we can control so uh, dramatically. Uh, but this is a tree that does, doesn't feel like we should do that. Um, has a fuzziness. Oh, thank you. Oh, I was just, I was just cool. doing that for the, for the stream so they could see oh. the front. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it it's an this interesting is, choice of front. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. It, uh, does everybody see this, this branch? That uh, Some of the main features of this tree are right in the front, the chosen front. Um, tree, let's see. So I think that f this, the spacing this was like, like 8 o'clock. 8? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost, like, almost somewhere in there in the exhibition. So the branch that comes off the front of the tree crosses the trunk, goes to the right. Does everybody see that? That's an old branch. It has bark on it. This is one of these things that uh, begins to level up into, into conversations about tree quality and tree characteristics. These are th parts of the tree you wouldn't change. It's much like the trunk itself. Um, we, ch we choose the trunk because we love it. We don't choose it because we want to change it. Old branches uh, of this nature, some of uh, uh, really, really old junipers might have branches with shari on them. Um, and then they're not something that we want to diminish. We want to feature them. Um, so Greg has chosen a, a very bold front, I think, on this one. I stood in front of this tree for a while pondering it. I, it's just it's one of these trees that makes me think and question and doubt myself, and I like that. <laughs> um, the, pot, uh, the pot feels a little young to me. All it needs is some fake patina. Uh, I didn't even get a laugh. Uh, <laughs> real patina would be wonderful, but it, it feels a little fresh out of the kiln, whereas this tree feels like uh, I want to bow down to it. It's a really, really old tree. This feels like a temple. Um, and, um, and the pot should, should be worn. It should be like the steps of the temple. It should be, um, should be uh, stone that has been worn by many feet. Um, so... Just a couple thoughts there. Maybe a lip a little, little bit thicker too. It's a pretty chunky uh, trunk. So this is just a couple of little technical points. Yeah, this is a, obviously a strong tree, old tree. So it looks to me, it, it was a hard one to, to judge by any traditional standards with the, the crown behind. Um, the flow is, as Michael said, not, not real uh, obvious with the way the branches are moving around. I, I think there's a little too much foliage throughout the tree, though. There's, there's a lot of shoots coming off all along every branch. I think a little more definition in the pads could help to uh, increase the look of age, which this tree is definitely going for. I agree with the pot. Um, something older would be really nice to, to really pair with, with this wonderful bark that this has, because you don't see that too often on these spruce that you're, you're getting out there. Um, this one, I feel like this branch up here goes out a little too far for being way up on the top of the tree. With the profile of the tree, this goes out beyond the rest of the tree. I'd like to maybe bring that in a little bit, maybe bring a lot of the branches in just a little bit to uh, really show off that, that wonderful trunk that the tree has. But overall, very, very nice. Yeah, over, overall, a very natural appearance, and I appreciate that about the tree and the, the way it's been worked on, but also, I have issues with balance, and that's what I look at on any tree is, is there something about the balance that's off? And it is difficult with a tree like this to, to say what is good and bad balance, I know. But personally, like how I would want to see it would be along the lines of what Bobby's saying about branch length and having, you know, mixing that up a bit and making that more defined and a little more obvious, not making it crispy clean or sharp or anything like that, which we do on the styling of a lot of conifer in the beginning to set that structure and then that takes a few times sometimes and then the tree will soften up and if it if it holds its structure like you want it to then you'll get those nice mature looking pads with a you know soft fine branching out all out of the tips making a, a dense little pad and I think that Engelmann spruce have the ability 
to have that uh, if they're worked on in that, that manner. And uh, the lower branch, it is a really nice old drop branch and that stands out the most to me with the deadwood. So I, I agree with uh, wanting to view the tree from, from where. I'm still confused about where the front is exactly. <laughs> over here and it kind of seems like it's falling away from us a little bit too which that that bothers it doesn't bother me so much that the canopy is kind of sitting behind here but the trunk itself kind of goes away a little bit so maybe tilting it forward slightly bringing the canopy so the trees bowing towards you a little bit more would be nice to see and i would like to see this lower pad just be a little less heavy just more separation and more tidiness overall because it, it has it's pretty healthy it's done well has a ton of buds on it, so you see how well these back bud. And I know Colorado blue spruce also have that capability and develop really well. All right. I'm going to mark the front so that you guys know what the hell we're talking about. Okay. At least as it was shown in the exhibition. Now, I think when we start to talk about bonsai, we talk about bonsai as an art and bonsai as an art and bonsai as an art. And what we see most of the time is bonsai as a craft. Right? We see a repetition of a shape, we see a repetition of a form, we see a repetition of a construct, and we see the pursuit of perfection of that repetition. Okay, this is bonsai uh, w widely practiced across the world. And I think that when we start to talk about bonsai as a reflection of nature, breaking the craft and starting to tap into the art, you've got to look at trees and you've got to start to put yourself in the shoes of the person who created it. If you know Greg, you know Greg is very artistic, you know Greg is very, very out of the box, and you also know that Greg spends a lot of times in the Cascades. And this tree clearly offered the potential to be able to execute something that Greg has identified with and touched on, and he wanted to be able to convey from his idea and the abstraction of those concepts that he saw in the Alpine in terms of this tree. And this is where, in my critique yesterday, I told everybody in the critique, don't judge this tree because you don't understand it yet. Sit with the tree. Sit with the tree for 10 minutes. Sit with the tree for 20 minutes. Sit with the tree until you start to understand what it is Greg is trying to convey with the composition. This is interpretation of art. This is interpretation of the dialogue that is being created by the piece. I didn't actually get to break through with this piece until standing here right now listening to these guys look at it as it was rotating. And all of a sudden you start to understand some of the complexity of the design that's occurring here. Because when you're in the Alpine, there's multiple things that can happen in the Alpine. The apex clearly was sheared off, and it wasn't just a, a small apex. It's not a small gin at the top. Half the trunk tore off of this tree. Now, typically when you lose a smaller portion of the apex, you'll get all of these uh, st sort of tip growth competing for that apical dominance, and we get a multiple apice form of tree. But when you lose the majority of the trunk of the tree, you have this form that's existed below that for hundreds of years as these branches have been weighed down, and they can be quite dense. They can carry that sort of what we would consider as being youthful, but when we start to see how much bigger this tree was, there wasn't that juvenile sort of vigor to form those new leaders and create that composition because of the size of that, that gin, and we see what happened to this tree. This is actually carrying forward a very alpine form that is probably fairly literal to something that he's experienced in the Cascades and his time in the, in the alpine and the natural environment. And all of a sudden, you start to break through because you're saying, okay, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, but when you look at it as an interpretation of the individual, this is a very, very strong piece, extremely communicative piece, extreme, extremely illustrative piece. There's not the formality of this crosses the trunk, so it's wrong. It shouldn't be a bone side. That goes back to that formality. That goes back to that nuts and bolts. That goes back to the practice as a craft. And I think this is a really significant dialogue about experiences in the mountains that the creator of this tree is trying to convey in the composition that he created. And this is really where we start to touch on that next level or execution of nature in miniature, execution of our experience as a practitioner, and the conveyance of how we've taken in that natural image and started to execute it as a, as a form in a containerized environment for people to interpret and share that landscape with them. Because of that, super, super powerful, powerful piece. But you have to sit with it. Because if we approach bonsai with the bias and the judgments, we're supposed to say trunk shouldn't cross the branch, apex should be towards the front, right? Too dense for this scale of tree. Yes, in the craft form, yes. 
But we always talk about bonsai as an art. What does it mean to be able to do bonsai as an art? We start to deviate from that because it's what you as the creator are communicating, right? And that took me two, two, three days of seeing this tree to really be able to tease that out and start to understand it. But I think there's a lot of really intentional brilliance in the design because I've seen this tree. I've seen multiple trees of this nature. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I get it. I get it. I've been here. Like, that's the most powerful thing that you can create for somebody. Draw that connection to the environment. Draw that connection to that place, right? Container, cool. You know, all the flaws, cool. Best thing about it is it connected me. Connected me to the place. Are there any questions or comments? No. Moving on. Nice tree, Greg. Personal nice favorite. Job, Personal favorite of Greg's collection there. One of the. Is this best in show? Did this one best in show? Did it? Whew, such a treat this tree is. What's that? Bob, yeah, Bob. What do we have here? What's that? What, what do we have here? What That's Como Cypress by Bobby King. There he is. Woo! <laughs> is this the last tree or we have more? This is it. This is it? Unload the clip. Front in the show is over here. Is this me? Sorry, <laughs> I'm just enjoying. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful tree. I remember seeing this tree years ago when we were starting to balance this uh, together. Um, and Bob has done a marvelous job. We were talking earlier about uh, um, how the pad structure uh, can give an intimation of, of, of age, antiquity. This is starting to do that, starting to become modular. It's a rather simple idea, but it, it does have uh, a bit of punch. Again, that's from the tradition. This is, uh, um, this is something we learn when we, when we learn bonsai. And all of us will take something different from the tradition. Um, this one is a fairly traditional tree. Uh, the pot has a dohimo, this little belt, belt line here. Uh, adds a little mark of uh, distinction to the tree. Um, I like the pot shape for this tree. It's sort of a soft tree. Um, my feeling is that it could be a, t a touch larger, again, just to make a couple technical points. Um, I think years ago, this area died off. I think I remember that happening. Uh, we found something. Uh, and this is something you might want to do with your trees. If you see a little piece of bark popping off, tap it with your finger, and if it sounds kind of dull, you probably have a little dead area there, and it might add a lot to your tree. Don't fear those things. Investigate them. Use them. Um, I don't mind that you see a little bit of this from the front. I think this adds a bit of uh, mystery to this tree. I kind of like that. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's funny. This tree really brings me back to Japan, actually. Um, they don't use skumo very often. Uh, they might use it on some of the, uh, the small size, but uh, you don't really see many large trees. Um, I'm not really sure why that is. They used to use uh, cryptomeria a lot as well, but I think there's a mite over there uh, that you ho almost never see it anymore. It's really fallen out of favor. Uh, but in any event, this is a, a, a fairly uh, easy plant to take care of. If you, if you live in the Willamette Valley or in a, uh, any area that has sort of a hot, sunny climate, again, just to make a, a technical point or two, um, you might want to protect this from just a, uh, a, bit, a bit of sun scorch. Uh, this summer, we, we, we saw a lot of that in our yards here. Um, and uh, they seem to do, do well with, uh, with that. This is a tree you can pinch. We talk about trees you can pinch, trees you can't pinch. There's a whole bunch of trees that you can pinch. Um, this is one of them. You can train these like uh, Hinoki cypress. You can also cut Hinoki cypress, but <laughs> if, uh, if the shoot has gotten too long. Uh, yellow cedar is another one. Uh, cedar is an awful name. Where I grew up on the East Coast, we called a juniper cedar. There's cedars down in California, they're not cedars. There's cedars up in Vancouver Island, they're not cedars. They're, they're cupressus, they're cypresses. Um, so um, uh, 
there's a, there's a between genera there, there, there's a bunch of trees that you can pinch and you can pinch these you, you probably have to pinch them several times a year um, to keep them uh, contained a little bit um, so these gentlemen I'm sure we'll talk about grander schemes I'm, I'm covering some nuts and bolts here <laughs> Um, this is a kind of tree you can you can peel the bark off a little bit. You might even want to. Um, we have uh, so many bore problems, um, and the eggs of the bore are laid underneath the bark uh, of uh, of most of our conifers, and you wouldn't want to do that with a pine. But with a lot of these these other trees like uh, junipers and the and the, and the cypresses, um, uh, the cypresses uh, like this one, especially when you begin to have some deadwood, you might want to make a bit of a contrast there. And then on the other side, just for the the health of the tree, if you're not using a systemic, you might want to take away that that option for the boar. Um, they're all over the place. We've, we've had some uh, uh, big problems with boars. I think every one of us have, has had, we, you don't want us to cry, but we, we can, we, we just won't go there. Um, protect your trees. <laughs> uh, I hand this over. I just covered a few nuts and bolts. Uh, this is a lovely tree. Um, I've been kind of hammering this point about the age of the pot. This is a tree that obviously has quite a bit of age and love and care into it. Show that you've done that with a nod of the pot. We talked a little bit on some of the earlier trees about using the pot to signify something that you like about the tree. And I hope that one of the things that we like about this tree is its majesty, its dignity. And, and that's communicated by age. So let's see a pot that, that shows that. Oh, I agree uh, with Michael about the shape of the pot and the style. I think that's a nice touch. Uh, really ties in with the tree well. And then, yeah, I do. When we were first looking at this in the show, you know, noticing that deadwood there actually without it would not be half as good because it would give it give it that more of that inverse taper. But having it tells us more of a story for sure and does not is not a flaw. I don't see that as a flaw. I just see that as character for an old tree like this. And obviously, again, pads very well developed. Balance looks good to me. The parent trunk should always be outweighing the, the child, so it has a much broader canopy and everything kind of falls into place and you still see some separation between those nicely formed pads. So really not much else to say about this, I don't think, besides touching on that age in the pot thing. That's a, a given to me as well. I would want to try to do the same if it were my tree. So yeah, I think that's all, all I'm going to say on this one. Yeah, I'd, I'd say balance is what really makes this tree stand out from the, the canopy, perfectly shaped, the pads with their separation, the fullness all throughout the tree, on the small tree, the big tree, all the branches, all very well balanced, which is what makes this tree really, really so fun to look at. And uh, even with the pot, it was just all, all really harmoniously done. Um, very few defects to the tree. This die off here, really added a feature, I think, to the tree. If that were just a trunk, yeah, you'd have taper, but it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be anything special then. It'd just be flare. So that, that dead wood turned out to be a nice thing. I would be careful when they're touching the ground or going into the ground like that. It's a chance for the dead wood to soak up water, so you do have to watch that carefully uh, and just make sure it's not rotting away on you there and soaking up into your dead wood more. Um, but... Yeah, it's a beautiful tree, so. And that can happen real quick when uh, it's in contact with the soil. The roots can climb up through that deadwood once it starts to rot and, and speed up that process even further. So if you're trying to keep shari or deadwood solid over the future and for in the future, then do everything you can to keep it clean and yeah, out of contact. I would agree. Did you guys select this as best in the show? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Michael? Um, I didn't. <laughs> what was your best in the show? It was a ponderosa pine. Cool. Mm. Yeah. That was a tough. That was that was a tough one. Mm. Yeah. It was a tough it was. one between the it, ponderosa. It, it and really was. Tough. Yeah. I would say that this is a better balanced tree. The ponderosa had some balance issues. We talked about density. This is this is evenly dense mm. throughout. Yeah, the ponderosa uh, was that, nice, but I also noticed a few brown needles on it too, which are just really minor things. But when you're judging between two really nice trees, mm -hmm. those little things 
mm. or what you're making. That Every detail out. matters That's for Best point. in Show, right? Absolutely. Anywhere in the world. Absolutely. A absolutely. Without a doubt. So I think when you start to look at the quality of the tree in the exhibition and we start to talk about this tree as Best in Show, you, you, you really, particularly... That show was very difficult to judge. I walked in there on Friday, and they said judge, and I had a minimal amount of time before the exhibition opened, and I was walking around, and I was just, it takes a while to calibrate to the quality of the show, the layout of the show, the elements that are engaging with the show. It does take a while to calibrate. You've almost got to let yourself acclimate to that environment and the trees that are present. So I couldn't judge on Friday. I walked in. I was like, this just isn't going to happen, right? There's too much here to look at. There's great material. There's well-executed trees. There's interesting display methods. Um, and so I came back Saturday, and I looked again. I looked Saturday morning. I looked Saturday at lunch, and Bob kept asking me, have you done your judging yet? Have you done your judging yet? And Reed's like, we need you to judge. We need you to judge. And I just couldn't get there. It took me a lot of time to calibrate in that show. So then I went back after my 5 o'clock workshop ended yesterday, and uh, the judging was very quick. It took me about five minutes to judge the show in terms of my selection of top five for each category. This tree really stood out with me for a multitude of reasons. Um, and, 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 and when we choose a best of show, I think we need to really be able to illustrate that to you guys so that you understand where those nuances are. And there's been a few that's been touched on, but let's kind of dive into this and let's go a little deep with this tree, okay? First and foremost, uh, wonderful relationship in terms of thickness to the child trunk and the parent tree. This is a very formulaic or I, I would say a formal aspect of design. Now there is a two dimensionality to the orientation. It's very planular in the front. This is a very flat front. There's also a hole right here, right in the middle, that is a real eye draw. It's an aesthetic sort of suck to your attention because there's that symmetrical form right in the front of the tree. And to some degree, it's like you look at that and, and it is and it's there. Um, it's got a lot of age around it and actually some of the lichen is decreasing the symmetry of that circular form, which helps a lot. Um, but I think this piece on the back right is actually what takes some of the two-dimensionality out of the trunk because the dead is not squarely two-dimensionally and evenly distributed on the right side of the trunk. It's actually to the back. And so you get this depth, even though you have this two-dimension orientation of these two trunks, you get this depth with this thing that happened and really serendipitously gave the best front of the tree in terms of the angle between the two trunks and that presentation of the tr two trunks. It actually solved that issue that we had with the two trunks. So that's very, very magical and appropriate. And it's not very often that you get that kind of serendipity in an uncontrolled gesture in the tree. Okay, when we look through the quality of the tree, very minimal wire, it's clearly been a bonsai a long time. Structure is impeccable, thickness of branches, origin, all of those things, movement. When we talk about any sort of characteristic flaws on the front of the tree, they're not there. And this is not a collected tree. This is a cultivated tree. This is also a tree that I'm assuming has some history. Talk probably... This is a talk tree, right? One of the pioneers of bonsai in the Pacific Northwest. So now you have that provenance that's also contributing to the tree. And then we start to step into the branching, the distribution of the branching, the ramification. And one thing that you should know when we start to look at the nuances of species, when we talk about Scomo cypress, they very easily elevate towards the sun and you get this really exposed under ramification. And if they're not well managed, they're not pruned appropriately, the growth isn't controlled over the course of the year, you can very quickly lose lose this beautiful branch structure where you show the age of that branch when we lay it out flat and then it starts to show that patina and the branching. This is very valuable, but you can go past that and you see it go past that. It's a lot of labor to regain that and start to pull that aesthetic back into the tree. Every branch on this tree is handled in a way where that ramification and that age is shown. It's not overdone. It's not underdone. There's no artificiality. This is this is bonsai technique on a higher level, understanding of aesthetic on a higher level, and, and to look at this and see that uniformly across the tree is really magic. It's magic. It's absolutely beautiful execution. Okay, beyond that, there's some touch of artistry in here too, because as much as this is a traditional, as much as it has a lot of formality to it, the decisions in terms of timing and the style of the work that was performed, when this is being shown, you have the grow out of growth management. You have these fronds showing that characteristic sort of uh, uh, you know, slight droop to it that makes a Tsukomo cypress a Tsukomo cypress. And if we overly manage, we could manage this into tight bundles that are pinched and they're showing a lot of tightness and a lot of constriction and a lot of bonsai. But this is showing Tsukomo cypress. And that timing, that understanding, that execution to presentation is a very big part of that higher level of showing a tree. That is what a show winning tree is taken into consideration and executed as to be a show winning tree. 
being at the national show, there were a lot of, uh, of thuya that have obviously a coarser, but a same frond-like form. Some of them had been tightly wired and tightly pinched just prior to the national show. And you saw a bonsai, you didn't see a thuya. And to see this executed, so every single branch density-wise, ramification-wise, distribution-wise, and to have this nuance of that timing, to have that maturity that carries forward the Tsukomo Cypress feel, that is something that I've never seen before with a Tsukomo Cypress. I've never seen one well executed to this degree because they are a lot of work to manage. Beyond that, aesthetically, coming back to Scott's, the original hemlock, and Michael saying, listen, the, the negative space and the breaking up of what was once a very juvenile form of the branch and these very large pads and now starting to establish these smaller pads gives you a sense of scale in this tree that is really powerful. Notice how many breaks there are in pieces of negative space inside of one area, one stanza of structure. This makes the tree feel big, it makes it feel large, right? It makes it feel like we can engage with this tree. It doesn't feel compressed and compacted. This isn't one block, two blocks, three blocks, and they're overly large. The scale of all of the pads is so well executed. So when you take all of that totality into account, right? There's so many good trees in the exhibition of there's a lot of powerful material, there's a lot of great work, there's a lot of age, but this level of execution, it was very unique and specific to this tree, right? And this tree really bears that fruit of the combination of technique and artistry that we hope to see in that level of a show winning tree in a really high quality exhibition. Any questions? Job. Scott, I'm coming. You've talked about the uh, dead portion on the backside of the trunk, and I can see that it extends up to both trunks a little bit. And we can see it peeking around the right corner, and I'm just wondering, since it's already there, I wouldn't introduce it art of, you know, on its own. I don't want to make it into a juniper, but could you bring it around, say, on the main trunk and even in the, the smaller trunk, bring it around the side a little bit to peek around to kind of give a little bit more of a story, a little bit of ancient history, making the tree look a little bit older if we just pulled it around just a little bit more to peek around the other side. You're talking about a little bit showing on this side? Yeah, or on the Extending back. it a little bit Extending onto the main on trunk a, on the right. Or yeah. uh, farther up the main trunk on the in I between think so. the two. Yeah. Oh, I see. So that maybe even spirals slightly so that you can pick up an, it's mm. there. So why not just make it peek around so you get credit for it? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Okay, extending something that is, uh, that's already given to you. I think that main Playing shari on, on the back side could be tapered up into the trunk a little more because it looks like it was kind of abrupt how it stopped there. So it could be a little more natural, I think. The softness of the line could be extended a little bit to, to soften it out, I think. I don't know if it would peek around to the front necessarily. You wouldn't want to get too close to that lower branch either because that live vein is keeping that. Lower uh, branch, uh, the, uh, the, the lower trunk uh, over here um, should feel a bit younger, so maybe... Maybe not showing Shari here, but maybe extending it here is certainly an option. Any other comments? I'm going to say no. Absolutely yeah, not. Yeah, absolutely not. And here's why. Uh, you already have some dead in there and you have recession or swelling of the living tissue and recession of the dead. This is the shrink swell effect, right? And if you try to carry that onto the living tissue that exists now, you're going to highlight that bulge that exists above that dead wood and it's going to defeat. It's going to actually highlight and increase that that concept of inverse taper. So then what do you do? Do you carve out that inverse taper and you continue to carry this deadwood up and you recognize that what you've just done is you've opened up a hornet's nest in terms of that deadwood showing that inverse and so you take it up and 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 you recognize, oh geez, what did I do? So there's a lot of serendipity in terms of how it's played out to defeat that two dimensional front but I think also you've got to know when to stop, right? You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. So for this, you've been given a really beautiful gem that adds some quality to the tree, trying to extend it and trying to make this tree something that it is not. It isn't necessarily uh, a, a juniper. And the contrast of the living and dead isn't the element of this tree that gives it value. And when we start to touch on those real sort of, I think, identification of where the quality of this tree exists, the quality of this tree exists in the smoothness and the formality and the quality of the structure and the secondary presentation. It's, it exists ultimately in the craft and the work.
and not I don't think so much in that sort of addition of those elements that try to make it an ancient tree. It feels like a big tree. It doesn't feel like an ancient tree. And if those things happened in the future, we develop the ways to deal with them. But to add them artificially, thinking that we're going to improve the quality, I think it would only cause more problems, not add. Well, it is. I was, I was referring more to the the main trunk, and the extension would be very subtle. It wouldn't be much at all. It would just soften up the line a little bit. It would it would You're taper it out a tiny bit. Right here. On the main trunk is where I was referring to. Yeah. I don't the, think that would. I, I honestly don't think that would hurt anything or be a structural flaw to extend it just a tiny bit to make it a You're little. You're talking about right here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the back, not not bringing it around. That's there. right. Not on the smaller trunk down there. Just just this section here. You guys can see kind of, it looks a little unnatural to me the way that is finished. I think that could look slightly more natural and mm. done very carefully just sure. a little bit. Yeah, but I think the discussion is, do you yeah, carry I'll, this around? And I, yeah. I think, you know. The, That's, that, that side is unnecessary, I would agree. Yeah, I, I just think, you, I think you're playing with fire a little bit. And also, you know, like, um, yeah, I think it, when we, when we do bonsai, the, the idea of how much age are we trying to show, like we have this very nebulous idea of we're, we're trying to make it look old. What, what does that even mean? We're trying to make it look old, right? And, and I think like when you start to talk about that term old, well, what is old to us as human beings versus what is old to a tree? And also if you're five years old, somebody who's 25 years old is old. And when you're 25, somebody who's 60 is old. And when you're 60, somebody who's 100 is old, right? So this is a subjective idea. And when we talk about trees and you talk about age, what is an old tree? What is a young tree? This is also subjective because if a tree lives for 3,000 years, is it old at 100, old at 500, old at 1,000, old at 2,000, old at 3,000? Because if we don't quantify that, Every tree has a different iteration of shape in each of those segments, just like human beings do, right? So uh, a 20-year-old tree, a 50-year-old tree, a 100-year-old tree, a 500-year-old tree, a 1,000, they look different. Where does this material offer you the opportunity to hop into that life cycle of the tree and execute the aesthetic that maximizes what the tree is giving you to represent that phase of life? This is that next level of talking about old. It's talking about old in terms of how do we quantify old in terms of what the material is giving us to execute that rendition of that species at that moment in time in that environment. And I think this is a really good execution of this tree at that stage of its life, which is not an ancient tree. It might be old. It's more of a mature tree. We're in the 100-year range with this piece representing the shape that it exists. Now, this is going to outgrow this. This is going to get bigger, it's going to get fuller, it's going to be more difficult to maintain some of the interior branches, etc. And that's where we can take it from a 100-year-old tree to a 250-year-old tree in the next iteration of design. Right? And we quantify, what does that mean to age that tree? Aged trees have more negative space, more remnants of what was. We talked about this with the Shimpaku. This would be the next stage of this tree because you can't keep shoving it back into the 100-year-old range. You stop the evolution of the tree. So we say, oh, okay, it grows, we prune it. It grows, we prune it. It grows, we prune it. Well, you know that it's going to continue to grow no matter how much you prune or else you're going to kill it. So then you've got to figure out those other elements of, okay, it grows, it prune, grow, prune, grow, prune. Now it doesn't look any good. What do we do? You carry it down that life cycle one more iteration. I'd be excited to see that when the time comes because I remember working on Hinoki cypress uh, of this you know, level and you know, pretty large trees as well, nice and full and dense. You know, they get that over time being maintained as well as, as well as this one has at least. And once you do make some, once it does reach that point where it's too full, it starts to look like a young tree again. Yeah. And you lose light on the interior, Absolutely. especially then you go and make some selections to, to make more negative space like Ryan was saying. And that, you know, gin on a, on a cypress like this can also be a nice uh, touch of age in the totally. future. Totally. Yeah. There was another um, uh, thing I, I just want to uh, mention a little story. I, I had, um, I had an experience uh, many, many years ago. I was a potter at the time, and I saw a workshop where, uh, and this, this story is about age and sort of the assumption of age, uh, where it, it was a pine workshop, and the presenter um, had everybody in that workshop create gin and shari on these pine trees. They were young trees, and it almost made me ill. I, I, I felt like you know, there was no, no chance for any of those trees to go through a youth. And, and, and to kind of discover their own story, to, to have something die on them and, 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 and you know, have that be a feature uh, that was discovered. Um, so uh, uh, there was just one thing that ran through my head when we were talking about that age here. Yeah, and, and I also think when you look at this tree, one thing to consider as well, when you look at the number of Tacoma cypress that were grown that aren't of this quality, this is, this is a, a, you know, a two or three percenter 
of the Tacoma Cypress. That also has to weigh into uh, us as judges looking at that show. How valuable is the material? How valuable is the work? How good is the presentation? And to see this level of Tacoma Cypress, when you know so many Tacoma Cypress have had so many issues and don't reach this level of material, that too plays into it. Because the highest level of material with the highest level of work creates the highest level of bonsai. Right? Material selection, understanding the nuances that make a Tacoma Cypress truly special when you've seen a lot of Tacoma Cypress that are run of the mill or even less than. And as a grower, as a creator, you're always going to have the smallest number of the highest level of material, and you're going to have a larger number of the middle material, and you're going to have the largest number of the lowest quality material. This is the part of growing bonsai. You can't get it perfect no matter how talented you are, right? Because the tree carries most of the weight and does most of the heavy lifting. So to have all of this come to fruition really does make this a show-winning tree. It really makes it a special tree. And all of these nuances where we're at in bonsai in the Western world right now is we're starting to be able to appreciate those. Our dialogue and our vocabulary is growing to be able to understand the nuances that are appreciated in Japan and used as a reference in Japan. We had to grow up. We're having to grow up because our trees are getting to a point, our technique is getting to a point, and our understanding is growing so that we do get to execute this, but then we have to be able to speak about it. We've got to have the dialogue, we've got to have the vocabulary, and the understanding of those nuances to be able to really identify, holy crap, this is amazing, right? Well, thank you for very much. You have taken us on quite a journey in these two hours with seven trees. I have to turn this room around. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.